so Sara, you were a member of a shall we call it communist commune in America for quite a while. Do you want to tell us about how you ended up in a in a commune? Well, so let's see, I was 22 out of college, living with my girlfriend in Vermont, working well, first uh first a shitty canvassing job for <laughs> you know, your typical um liberal nonprofit and then shitty jobs in coffee shops and such. And we were looking for other things. I was, I started reading, I probably left college kind of with a, I don't know, typical sort of liberal, liberal democratic kind of outlook on things. And I joined this Chomsky reading group that year. And we read, I think it was the Chomsky reader, but it was selections from him. And I was really, I was really taken by his accounts of syndicalism and what he, his description of what the real socialist alternative was. And then there was, there was a documentary on Chomsky that came out that year. This was 1993, I guess, in which he spoke more, or I heard him more speak about the collectives in Spain during the Spanish revolution of 1936 and the Israeli kibbutz, which he lived on in the fifties left for a number of reasons, but part you know, one was their exploitation of Palestinian labor. And the other was the uh, limited opportunities in the intellectual arena, <laughs> but it did seem to impress upon him the, the sort of the dignity and feasibility of a truly egalitarian society and economy with all the, you know, caveats of being a settler colonial projects and all that. Uh, That basically all those things were things that corrupted the central egalitarian premise of the social project that the kibbutz seem more part of. But insofar as they realized it, it was very close to the communist ideal and showed that it was quite feasible and had some real social and psychological effects on the people who were part of it. So I ended up for a little while, I was looking for programs that would like graduate programs, studying the small scale efforts of developing communist societies. And after a little while, I was just like, Meanwhile, my my girlfriend was looking at actual intentional communities in the United States and wanting to visit them. And finally occurred to me, like, why why am I going to go to school to study this when there are actual communities that are trying this out? In America at the time, was there more back in the 90s left over? Well, so there was a book called The Communities Directory. And that was put out by an organization that that pooled resources to publicize intentional communities of all types. And browsing that, perusing that directory, we quickly realized that there were only a handful that really were what we were looking for, which was basically secular, egalitarian, democratic communities that didn't have charismatic leaders or some kind of religious, spiritual bent. And the only ones that really fit this, almost the only ones that fit this were the ones that were part of the Federation of Egalitarian Communities, which is an organization of income sharing communes in the United States. And there aren't many. They started, the first one, Twin Oaks, was founded in 1967. So it had the start of the hippie commune era, um, which was a good time to start, even though they were rather different from most of the hippie communes. Um, There was a large population of people who were looking for that kind of lifestyle that served as kind of a feeder population for it while it was getting off the ground. And within a few years, it was well enough established with income sources and systems that were infrastructure, et cetera, that they were able to sustain themselves and slowly expand start a few other communities, some of which failed or broke apart, but a handful that stayed intact. 
Uh, it seems like if they if you make it ten years, then you're going to be there. You're going to stay a commune. And where did they get the initial like capital to purchase land or build houses or whatever for the commune? I'm a little vague on that. I did read Cat Kincaid's book about the founding of Twin Oaks, which was the first one in this federation and before the federation started. And I know that they, I remember it being a combination of most of the money coming from the initial members working outside jobs in a house in they they like rented a house together in Washington, DC and all work jobs until they had enough money to buy some land in Virginia. And I do remember from the book that there was one person who put in considerably more and it created it created tensions in the first year until that person left because he did donate the money like everybody else. But as is often the case, when one person has more resources and donated more, there's a tendency to feel like you should have more say about things. You, you sent me some video of uh, a couple of documentary clips about the, the place where, where you went, uh, Twin Oaks. And in it, they mentioned that the founder was like strangely, to, I was quite surprised that it was inspired by the work of B.F. Skinner. It just it struck me as very surprising. Yeah, yeah, it does surprise people. In a way, it shouldn't be too surprising because, well, I'll, I'll, so the story is that Cat Kincaid, who founded Twin Oaks, read Walden II, which was basically a utopian novel that B.F. Skinner wrote in, I think, 1948. And what he was describing was uh, something he thought was possible, which was a community that was run on the principles of operant conditioning. And what it's most criticized and remembered for is that it's not a, it's not a democratic society. And there is this is run by a board of psychologists who God damn. <laughs> plan all the refor- reinforcements, the continu- contingency <laughs> reinforcement that make oh, everybody, you know, love their jobs and be nice to everyone and all that. But she read that and she thought, well, this seems great and possible. Let's do it. So she used that as a model. And one of the things that they borrowed from Walden, too was this uh, labor credit system, which in Walden too was, because it's based on positive reinforcement, the thought was, will base the credit you get towards your, your income, your income quota, your income, your, your work requirements, I mean, on a, a variable numeric scale. So things like cleaning the sewers or something that nobody wants to do would get a uh, higher credit for it. So maybe it was five credits for cleaning the sewer and only one credit for playing with kids or, or whatever. So they, they set up a system like that and they had, and that's only, I mean, actually that's just, that's not the, the most important component of this behavior management idea, but it's one, one component. It's something that's very common in, in behaviorism to have these token systems for rewarding behaviors. Maybe maybe the tokens are for a severely mentally disabled child, like a number of peanuts they'll get for for com- d- doing something. Or for higher functioning people, it'll be some kind of token, numerical token system, and then they get a reward when you know they earn ten tokens. Just like school, that that sort of thing. So they did implement that, and then it had the consequence I told you about before that people just didn't like that they were getting less credit for some of the work, and there were certain ways you could kind of game the system. Like if you were the only person who did it, you just refused to do it for a few weeks, and the point value would go up. You know, you could get more work, more more money, or more you know labor tokens, or whatever you want to call it, labor credit for the same job you did a few weeks ago. So they just eventually abolished that. But the idea with the the behaviorism was that together as a group, rather than as a board of psychologists, they would think through why there were social problems and why certain jobs were not being volunteered for and try to change the 
the conditions around them so that the work was more re reinforcing or the behavior that the community wanted to see more of was, was reinforced. I, I personally think that it was, pro and Kat Kincaid thought that that was, the, because they had that, that orientation, that that was why the community was more successful than most other communes that, that formed at that time. That they were thinking very actively of what were the, what were the reasons that people weren't behaving in the way that, that they wished. How did that philosophy continue, say, by the time you arrived on the scene there in the early 90s? What, what was it practically like? It wasn't, it was not officially a behaviorist community. You had some members, particularly some of the older members. There were still people there from the early days, a few of them, um, including Kat. She had moved back. So there were people who had a behaviorist orientation, but there was no behaviorist policy. The so-called planners, which was like a rotating board of people who made central decisions. There were lots of checks and balances and stuff on it, but they still had this planner management system, which was different from the community I lived at for the longest later Eastwind that had a different, a different system, not a planner management, a planner manager system. But it didn't really, I mean, the main way that it continued, I'd say, is that people did want to use things that were reinforcing, positively reinforcing rather than punishing. So, uh, and one consequence of having a non-coercive labor system that values all the work equally in terms of the labor credit is there are still things that are less desirable to do where people don't have the skills for it, but maybe not the interest in, in developing the skills. So you still need to think about how to make undesirable things desirable. And people just collectively use creativity to find ways to uh, make things more desirable. So for instance, the only place, it was basically, we were all living, if you divided the income through the businesses equally, we were all far, far below the poverty level. I think the per capita income was something like $5,000 or something, even in 1993 was <laughs> not very much money, but we lived fine. But there were, we didn't live luxuriously. So one of the things the community didn't buy a lot of was coffee. And they made the decision that the coffee would be in the hammock shop where people made hammocks to sell. And so if you wanted a cup of coffee, there was sort of an idea that if you have a cup of coffee, you make a hammock. That wasn't really followed, but, and it wasn't really something that there was uh, a lot of social pressure about. People came in all the time to get a coffee, but still you had to go to the workplace to get the coffee. And the hammock shop was a really social place. They developed that business because it was a form of work that was really pleasant to do. They designed a, a loom that two people could work on face to face so you could have a conversation. It was sort of the place you went to hear what was going on in the community because there'd always be, you know, people there working, making hammocks and talking about any sort of thing. So just as an example of how you'd turn something that might be really boring. I mean, you could have a typical way that that might have been set up in a, a capitalist business was every worker had their own loom isolated from each other. Maybe there was there was like a, a work quota of how many how many hammocks you need to churn out in an hour. And it's it's just a, a grueling, monotonous, isolating, alienating experience. But just by rearranging the workplace and having a value of making work something that's pleasant and convivial, you can totally change the character of that job. There were people that, that did all their work in the hammock shop just because they liked it. And so getting towards, you know, the, the productivity. So the what, like in the, say, your hours that you were, say, you had to do. So for people, listeners, the, the, the commune would vote on how many hours a week everybody needed to, to contribute. Mm -hmm. So if it was like, I think the video I saw was 43 hours was the working week. 
but that would include tidying your own house and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, not just in the, you know, in the loom or wherever, in the tofu right. factory or right. whatever it is. All those hours, our childcare would be in there too. But with respect to, say, like the hours you spent in the hammock loom, say, how was productivity maintained? Was it all like soft reinforcement or was there ever like you're here three hours, you've got to be doing at least five or six hammocks or whatever? Uh, there wasn't any, no, there wasn't any enforcement. And in, in general, just the attitude was, I mean, there's a recognition that people have, people, people had different abilities and, you know, one person could could make a hammock in an hour and another person, especially a new person, might take two or three hours. It, it's something, you know, it did work your wrists, so you had to take breaks. I mean, there's a different attitude in a society like that. You're, you're not valued for your quantitative productivity. You know, it, it's something that you, I, I mean, you, you if somebody is weaving twice as fast as you, you kind of want to do a little better or look or just watch them and see if they have a different technique. Talk about that. But no, there wasn't really any, they didn't measure it in that they had an account of how many hours went into hammock production. And you just divide that by the number of hammocks and you, you know, you're, your average rate and you can see whether the average rate is going up or down over time if it was going down then you could just bring that to attention of to the attention of people um, in a community meeting or newsletter and talk about why this might be happening do we have an influx of new people are weavers like getting older <laughs> maybe we need some new blood is there too much or you know are we taking too much breaks you just kind of talk about it the way you would among, I don't know, in a family or something like that. You don't have to, you don't have to punish anybody. I mean, people, one of the things that all the communities I've lived at had was an opinion board where people would post things all the time. I don't know if now they have electronic chat boards, but at that time it was essays, comments, opinions that were, were posted in the dining hall. People would vent about their complaints about, you know, slacking, goofing off or whatever. So you would get, you could get called out if you were, you know, just totally blowing things off. You might also not get accepted as a member or there were potential sanctions. Most often they were automatic if you just weren't getting your labor in at all, like just not earning the labor credits. Um, if you got three weeks in the labor holes, they called it, then there were processes for a community meeting about you or meeting with the labor managers and trying to figure out what's going on, um, maybe finding out if there was a health concern or a mental health issue going on that needed help with. But ultimately, you could get expelled if you weren't doing your fair share, as, as people said. Fair share was the word used all the time. So, like, we see in uh, some of the anthropology of these, you know, egalitarian uh, hunter-gatherers, uh, immediate return hunter-gatherers, that they have el elaborate cultural processes to maintain the egalitarian community functioning correctly. Was there, like, cultural elements as a, like that were more kind of abstract away from like a community meeting, meeting to complain about somebody not working? Hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it's funny. People, people from the outside are always, they ask a lot of questions about productivity and how you discipline the workforce. And those questions come up a lot. And those aren't necessarily the, primary concerns in people's lives there. I mean, these communities, they're, people did want to be productive. I mean, productivity is what made your life better, whether it's true, whether you're in an individualistic economy or a collective economy. 
if you're all pulling together and working towards the same goals, the shared benefits of, of production are, are bigger. So, I mean, people, people enjoyed having more good food and being able to build a new, a new building, have a better community center, buy more land um, to expand, all sorts of things. And there was economic planning towards these goals that people would vote on. And if people didn't do, do the work to achieve it, then nobody got it. So everybody would be disappointed and upset and trying to figure out what that was and maybe blaming certain people. <laughs> But, you know, in general, the, I would say the, the day-to-day, the day-to-day struggles and concerns were, were more social, like how to get along with people. It's not necessarily that, that the person you work with isn't producing enough, but maybe you don't like their communication style or they're, they're a little bossy or, you know, or they, they, they get a little more stoned than you would on the job. (laughs) (laughs) So let me go back to your question. So um, what were some of the, the cultural responses that reinforced egalitarianism? Yeah. Like, or or was there like outside of like formal processes, you know, like some of these Mm -hmm. things in the the hunter gatherers, they have this one always makes me laugh of, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, of insulting the meat where, the hunter would bring back, you know, a bison or whatever, and everybody'd stand around and go, look at this disease looking thing, even if it was the finest bison, and they would really insult the hunter. And he would have to apologize and say, oh, I'm sorry for bringing such a horrible, low quality, you know, thing. I shouldn't, I should have just throw, left it to rot instead of bringing it here. And everybody insults them and they all sit down. And it's, it's all around like bringing the hunter, the top hunter down off his pedestal, you know? Right, 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 right. In, 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 in a fun kind of yeah. way. In a fun in a, way, in a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. That would be a good question for a group of people who live, who live in the community. I mean, certainly, you know, if anybody gets too full of themselves, and bragging, you're, you're probably going to get teased. And I mean, the thing about a small community like that, which would be different for if there was a, a, a whole entire communist society based on this egalitarianism, or even, even a community, perhaps the size of the larger kibbutzim, you know, one or 2,000 people wouldn't be the same. But in a community, the communities I lived in were less than 100 people. You do know everybody. And you see everybody every day. So it's a lot harder to keep up pretenses. You know, you can't, it's not like you can come to work and nobody sees what you're like at home. So you can pretend that you, you know, live in this great house or you know, your lies, your lies are seen through pretty quickly. You know, you'll, you will be the subject of ridicule if you're, if you're full of pretense and bullshit. And then that can just be either either you kind of uh, get more authentic, or that's going to be part of who you're known as is you know the BS or you know the bragger, whatever. And it doesn't it doesn't increase your status; it's it lowers your status. Which in a community like that, status translates to how much influence you have. If you're the person who stands up at community meeting and says, you know. I can build this, da da da, but everybody knows you're full of it. <laughs> your your proposal isn't going to pass, <laughs> right? So, like, how self-selecting do you think the commune was? You know, for for harmonious living for people that don't shirk. Like, how realistic do you think the model say that we're talking about mm-hmm. so far? The Twin Oaks model that you're in would would scale. Yeah, I mean that's the big question. I mean this is this is the the social anarchist model of you know it's it's basically following the Gustav Landauer uh, motto of socialism will be free or not at all, which is basically saying it must be voluntary. If if the socialism isn't voluntary, then you won't have socialism because uh, socialism requires a non-coercive cooperation and 
if it's not voluntary, then you're, you're coercing and you're, you're going to have some kind of state coercive apparatus in your society. So that's a big open question. If you get into the, the history of the kibbutz movement, which I've studied, I've been interested in, was very interested in when I lived in the communes, but it's been a long time since I looked into them. They did talk about these problems because they had an idea of the communities being an integral part of a larger socialist project in, in that Zionist, the socialist Zionist project of establishing a, a, a socialist Jewish state. And it was to be integrated with labor unions and cooperatives that, that included private ownership, but that the kibbutzim would serve as sort of like the, the vanguard because they were, they were modeling where things should go. So they would function, it would be voluntary, a voluntary communist society within a larger socialist oriented political economy and serve as sort of like a, uh, a guiding trend. I guess I haven't really answered your question. I don't know. I mean, it's self-selecting. The second community I lived at, Eastwind, was much less selective membership wise than Twin Oaks. In Twin Oaks, you came, well, first of all, you wouldn't be moving there at all unless you felt some affinity with the values. So that's an initial selection. And then there is a formal selection that you have to go through a process of being accepted. And part of that is your work contribution, but that's pretty minimal. It just means that you've met the quota. You've shown that you've been able to work 42 hours a week. And the the bigger part was whether you have any social frictions with enough people in the community that people don't want to live with you. So there's a social selection. At Eastwind, it, when I lived there, it was much more open. Like there was, and it was a, a much broader, to me, it seemed like a, a more diverse group of people and a much more working class and poor population that, that joined the community. And there was no real, there was the work requirement, but uh, membership was just automatic. You just, you just automatically went from a visitor to uh, a provisional member to a full member. And it was only stopped if 20% of the people there had put in concerns on you and then there would be a vote or something like that. So people tended to just, unless you were a real asshole or a total shirker, um, you were going to be a member. And what I found really interesting is that people from any walk of life, like there were most of the people I'd say even who joined didn't have come with a, an ideology. Uh, they could have come from any walk of life really. And just sort of sick of sick of the shit that they had to deal with. Um, or maybe, you know, they were just struggling and they thought they'd try it out. And within, within a couple of weeks, they were thinking in terms of egalitarianism. Like when we were talking about whether, whether some, something somebody was doing seemed was right or wrong, you know, they'd say, well, that doesn't seem egalitarian. And the idea of fair share came, came really naturally to people. So to me, that told me that if you drop people into a culture that has these values, they're, they're pretty intuitive and they do seem right. And people, people start to think that way pretty quickly. It's like, you know, when you're, if you're a parent or something, you, you have a kid and everybody's, you, you cut the birthday cake up and you make sure all the slices are equal and the kids are always fighting over, he got more than me or she got more. And it's like, we, we raise our kids always like to be fair, to be equal. And then we, we send them into like the actual real world workplace. And then we go, ah, yeah, that shit. <laughs> forget, <laughs> forget about that shit. But I think that it's, it's very, very, like intuitive and and it's what that, that's to me such a, an important facet to hear like that that people can come and they naturally gravitate to the the ethos that 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 we're talking about 
Yeah, that was my experience that most people did. And the people who didn't were the people you didn't want there. Right. And, you know, it tends, you know, very self, it's sort of, and it mostly comes out of selfishness when you don't. When that doesn't seem right to you, it's usually not because you feel like somebody else is getting the short end of the stick. It's because you feel like you should get more. That That's what you see more often. And so that's a, that's an antisocial character trait that obviously is not what you want valued in an egalitarian society. Now, it's not, I don't want to pretend like there wasn't any resentment in that area or issues and getting things done wasn't always easy. And there was a small amount of more forced kind of labor. Like we had to have, we had to have, in addition to the regular labor quota, um, we had an income quota at Eastwind, which meant that there was a certain amount of hours that people had to work in the businesses, which if you were projecting that outside of a capitalist economy might be the equivalent of the essential work, you know, like getting the food, get, getting the crops planted, getting, you know, getting the machines built, whatever. But that wasn't really, I mean, that in itself wasn't really coercive. It was just it's just another way of sharing the work that you can't get done. There were two methods. Either you tried to make it more enticing, maybe making that environment more, more pleasant, social. Sometimes it was, if there was an area that was a little neglected, a group of friends might start working that area as a team. And then it became that friend group's you know, area. So that became a really you know, a part of the day that they looked forward to because it was friends who were working together, you know, working the warehouse together as a team. So there were social ways, but if things couldn't get done and it was essential to get them done, then you could make it a a rotating requirement to be part of it. And it wasn't really a problem. And I, I don't think that also seemed fair to people. Right. So that's the like paracon of the concept of like a job complex. You can't just be doing all the cool work. You got to take your share of the rubbish work. And right. to me, again, that seems like I've heard people complaining about this, you know, like we can talk about the workability or how you implement such a thing. But the concept of everybody putting in their fair share of crap work seems like something that would come naturally to people. Yeah. And it seems fair when you're a kid, like you're talking about, you go to summer camp, if it's, you know, unless it's some <laughs> elitist place, like already inculcating, you know, socializing you to class society, then you share things and you all have to take turns, like cleaning the latrine or whatever, doing the dishes, like you're, you're used to that as a kid. But then as an adult, you're supposed to just accept your place in society. And that's probably doing the shit work while you know, other people are the professors and rock stars and politicians. So some of the issues, like the stuff that uh, you sent me, some of the stuff seems quite related to the size of the communes. Mm-hmm. Like, so, you know, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, right? And so everybody knew everybody. And that's like a thing that when you're younger, it's like, oh, my God, you know, I can't get away with doing anything here. Everybody will know it. And in, in the commune life, because essentially like the communes aren't just everywhere. We're not living in communism. You can't just say, well, screw this commune. I'm heading off to this other commune. Like that you are essentially, you're, you're kind of trapped within a commune to a certain extent. And, you know, personal relationships and all that stuff can go sour just like, just like anywhere. Like, so how much of the problems in the communes are like, first of all, like what are the problems to do with the scale and then like what problems do you did you find in your communes that weren't to do with scale yeah well one good thing about being in a federation like we were is that people did move people did switch communes and often it was over a really terrible breakup you know they just <laughs> can't see that person anymore <laughs> so moved east winds or acorn one of the other ones 
so that was good. And I actually think, and everybody thought that having more, having more communities, particularly communities that were not really far away from each other would be very good socially because it would let you change your, get out, get away from people or just, just a change of sometimes just, you know, meeting new people. You're, if you're around the same 50 people year after year with just a few changes, I mean, most people want, want to meet new people, which was one of the reasons why the labor exchanges that I mentioned in the email were important. And I think it was the main reason why they were, they were started was not so much for the economic benefit of exchanging labor between the communities, but to have the, the social intercourse and build up social, more social ties and friendships between, between the groups. Uh, so what were the problems that were la- related to the scale and problems that weren't related to the scale? The social conflict problems and I suppose the, the kind of lack of privacy from living in a small community, that would be, that would be one that would diminish with the scale of the social unit. Ones that didn't, that would continue. I mean, it's only gonna get more complex to do the planning on a larger and larger scale. Although there's, there's probably certain like informational economy scales that might work against that. I mean, they had very interesting systems for democratic planning, but they would, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we could talk about that and you could think about whether which of those are are easily scalable? Do you want to talk about maybe the first one? You said Twin Oaks had planners. How did they do it? Yeah, this was like the one one of the vestiges from building the community off the model that that Skinner gave in that book. In Walden Two, there's a board of planners. I don't remember who makes them up, but who comprises them? But they definitely include psychologists because they're designing the, the contingencies for reinforcement of the community. And then there were plant, there were managers who I think were selected by the planners and they ran the, the technical, they managed the technical aspects of the community. So Twin Oaks had that system, only the planners, which I think were three people, it just worked by rotation. And it was the same at, at uh, Eastwind. We had a board of directors and it just rotated. So if you were there long enough, your time would come up. And they served as, you know, kind of like they, if there was an issue that a lower level couldn't decide or it affected too much of the community, then it would go to the planners and the planners would talk about it. And then they would post a proposal. If there were a lot of objections to it, then it would. It might go to a community meeting or a smaller meeting for interested parties to go to, and they try to work something out. There was a similar thing at Eastwind, but much more often things would go to a community meeting, and there would be a community-wide vote, meeting and vote on that proposal. In terms of the economic planning at Twin Oaks, the planners were. It was a major responsibility of them to determine how many hours of labor would go to different things and how the limited dollar funds of the community would would be distributed. And they would work out each manager. So areas were divided into managers. Managers were either elected or appointed. And they would have to submit their projected requirements for the year to the planners at the beginning of the year. The planners would review it. You were supposed to, uh, as a manager, just give your the hours and requirements for the basic maintenance of that area. And if there was some kind of increase or new, new aspect of the work you wanted to add that would increase the amount of labor or money requirements, then you were supposed to present that as a one-time resource allocation or like a separate thing that could be decided separately. And then there would be the planners would kind of review it and they'd, they'd set, look, this is the baseline. We, we need this. 
we're going to we're going to have to commit this many labor hours to maintain the minimum functioning but these are things we've decided are optional and then the community members were invited to work out their own breakdown of how they wanted to distribute them and which which projects they wanted to fund and uh, one of the things that would be and individual members would put in proposals for one-time resource allegations. And if you wanted to lower quota, that would be a resource allocation. You have to put that in as want a lower quota by two hours. That means 40,000 hours reduced from the annual labor budget. And then when people, if people wanted that in the trade-off game, they'd have to find the cuts to balance the budget. And then all these were submitted and somehow they, they compiled them, got the statistical averages and, and then posted something as this is the annual plan that we feel best matches the desires of the community and seems feasible and uh, won't have detrimental consequences other than the obvious ones from the trade-offs. Is this acceptable? And there'd be a vote on it. I think that's how it worked. It's been a long time. Um, Eastwind was much more, they had a, a very straightforward, simple democratic process. That was one of the differences they they wanted from Twin Oaks when they formed, is everything just works by direct democracy, and it's it's very straightforward. So there, each manager puts in a proposal, and it just gets voted on. It's also simpler because they don't have an assigned labor system at Eastwind. There's just a set quota that tends to stay from year after year. It was 40 when I was there. They've reduced it to 35. And you just approve things as something that is going to be recognized as labor that people can work on, but they don't set any budgets for anything, which means that there's there's less control over the economy, but there's also less management required around uh, the accounting of it and you know tracking. There's less budgets and stuff to, to keep track of. So uh, explain that a bit closer, like, so the different areas, you, like everybody just works at whatever is an accepted area of work. So whatever is being deemed as social work, say. Right. And and then the budgets are just spent on what's needed in the various areas ad hoc as they come up kind of a thing from a central fund. Well, for money that they have to, that's the main part of the proposal is at Eastwind when managers are presenting it for the annual plan is the the money allocation. But if it's a totally new project, then that project has to be approved too. And that'll that'll often be a separate meeting. You know, like when I was there early on, one of my friends wanted to build a straw bale house, you know, like a community house, but straw bale house. So that had to go through meeting, listen to, you know, they had to defend that this was something that was that was feasible. This is how much it was cost. This is my, my estimate of how much labor it would take. And then it just gets approved or, or not approved. And then the money, the money obviously, there's, there's a set basket of. With the labor, people generally put an estimate forward, but there was no, yeah, there wasn't a budget. It wasn't like we ran out of hours. It would just be, if that started to happen, then somebody might take note and say, hey, you know, there's been a lot more hours spent on this project. It's only half done. What's up? Maybe we need to review this. The consequence kind of, if we can use the term macroeconomically for, you know, the yeah. effect on just the, this hundred person community was that if that happened, then it would just show up as other things, other things getting neglected, you know, like, you know, obviously, if if people are working 40 hours a week, there's only so many hours to go around. And if there's more going to one area, then it's coming from somewhere else. So you would just sort of see it in other things getting neglected. And then people would talk about that. Maybe that project would become less popular um, in the community at large. And, you know, it might just get get mixed. Um, whereas at Twin Oaks, they had every area got a labor budget and the managers had to keep within that budget. And if you ran out, then you were just, that was it. There was no more labor. Although they had a weird workaround around with it that they could, 
exceed their budget if it was over quota hours, which I think was if people had worked 40 hours or met their quota that week, they could, they could do the extra work in that area. Doesn't totally make sense to me because your labor balance is how many hours you're required to work and anything you do over that is hours you can not do later. So I don't know, it's some sort of some kind of kind of equivalent of deficit spending that they that they <laughs> that they allowed there. Eventually yeah. it probably caught up because you know people would take their vacation and that that would get that would get lost later. But yeah. So uh, yeah <laughs> deficit labor hour spending. Um <laughs> MNT crowd would love it. MNT <laughs> communism. Um, 